Hey, what's up? What's up, everybody? You tuned in to another episode of Strategic Moves. I'm your host, Ken Dow. This is a place where we bring art, culture, politics, and business all together, and we do it every Sunday right here on this channel. But when I'm not shooting this podcast, I am the owner of Strategic Resources Consultant and the founder of the African American Men's Action Network. We call it Amen. I've been doing political consulting and public relations work in the state of Ohio for over 25 years, met some interesting people along the way, and I want to make your next move a strategic move, and this program gives me an opportunity to bring some of those people on the program. We share some of our experiences with you, and maybe there's something you can get out of that to help you in your personal life or maybe your business life. You never know. But if it sounds like there's something you might be interested in, what I need you to do is hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, and the notification bell as well so you would know the next time one of these programs is coming on. And we're going to get started right away today. But before I get started on that, i got to first give it up to the best podcasting producer in Cleveland today, and that's DJ True. How you doing back there, sir? I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Looking forward to this show. Got a good friend of mine. Been knowing him for years before he was... Who he is today, man. Okay, and it's okay. It's going to be a special show today. All right, you know what, then? Let's just get right to it, then. You want to introduce him? This your special friend? <laughs> special friend? <laughs> no, this is a good friend of mine. Introducing to you the man with the golden clippers, my <laughs> man, <laughs> Big Waverly Willis of Urban Cut. We got Urban Cuts in the house today, y'all. Urban Cuts. We got my man Waverly Willi- Willis in the house. I'm going to call him Waverly Williams all day. I, you know me. I'm bad with names. All the time. Waverly all Willis the time. is in the house today. He is a barber. He is a philanthropist. He is a entrepreneur. He is a survivor. And he's here today to talk to us about some of those things along those lines. So, Waverly, before we get started, like we do in all our programs, yes, everybody want to know a little bit about your business, man, where you're from. You're from Cleveland. You grew up here. You're part of this network, huh? I am from East Cleveland. Okay. And we ain't going to hold that against if, you. If you are <laughs> Cleveland, you can't, you know, because we are a prideful people, and we always make sure that mm-hmm. we're from Cleveland, but we're from East Cleveland. I went mm-hmm. to Shaw, I'm a proud graduate of Shaw High School, class okay. of 89. Ah. And so been here all my life. Mm-hmm. EC raised me, and mm-hmm. I've been through some tough times, and mm-hmm. I like to attribute my surviving all of those tough times. A, a lot of that come from my being raised in East Cleveland, East Cleveland. Ohio. I always got to. Let's dive into a little bit of that in tough mm-hmm. times growing up. What it was like, you grew up your whole life in East Cleveland, elementary, high mm-hmm. school? Yep, I went to elementary, junior high school, and high school in, in East Cleveland. Mm-hmm. And it was a poor community, but growing up, mom had a Mm-hmm. We, we didn't know we were poor, you know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. We ate good every day, mm-hmm. and it was a good, solid upbringing. So you, know? you grew up with you, your mom, your dad, or it was just you and your mom? Uh, my, my parents divorced when I was young, so mm-hmm. st- stereotypical, okay. uh, single parent, went my mom household. Mm-hmm. She did a great job. Did, did like, she work, or was she homebody, or how was uh, My mom worked. She was a maid. You know how when mm-hmm. they used to send you home with paperwork? Just asking about your family life. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now, she, she, she cleaned people's houses, but she mm-hmm. made me write down, and I didn't know at the time she was a domestic engineer. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea why my I used to put maid down all the time. She'd be mad. Be mad. Like, Don't call me no maid. I ain't right, nobody's maid. You know, but right. She cleaned people's houses and, mm-hmm. and just took care of homes. People that, that were well to do. How, how many? Yeah, brothers, sisters? I have two older brothers. They're both deceased and mm. one living older sister. One of my brothers we lost as uh, both of my brothers. It was a result of drug and alcohol usage. Mm. One was suicide. One was a car accident. Mm-hmm. And But the root of it was drugs and alcohol, which later on in life I became a victim of myself. You know? I, I know when I was listening to some of your interviews and, and going back, I know you talked about the fact that you said you were uh drug dealer that yeah. broke the number one rule yeah. before we get into breaking the number one rule though let's talk about being a drug dealer now yeah. you was back in east cleveland and back in those days east cleveland was hot it was hot back then streets like over there it was whole streets that you can go down yeah. that it was the carter and all this stuff we see in movies that yeah. was east cleveland we, for a we, while we purposely would you go down and unfortunately mm-hmm. on some streets it's still the same it's, yeah it's pitch black when you go down mm-hmm. some streets off of hayden we mm-hmm. purposely shot out the street lights because mm. 
that was our den of sin. It was mm-hmm. a, a drug dealer's paradise. But that's like you said, I broke the cardinal sin. I lived a dual life, though. Mm-hmm. I, I never got uh, in trouble in school. I mm-hmm. was on the honor and merit road. Mm-hmm. I was an all-star athlete. But Why I, was you selling drugs? What was your influence of doing because it? Because I wanted the cars, the girls, the shoes that they had. Again, my mom, she did a great job, Mm -hmm. but she wasn't buying us no Jordans. We had shoes, you know Mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Typical young Mm -hmm. person, immature mentality. Mm -hmm. Um, And again, and and back then, literally, you can walk off your porch and become a drug dealer. It was, and, and to that point, it was so rampant in the communities and so bad you literally was making the type of money that you were yeah, talking about. Yeah, you you literally, mean, yeah. We did good in high school, but I I went to high school with some real kingpins that mm-hmm. sat next to me mm-hmm. in history class. Like, <laughs> cats right. was rolling, like, mm-hmm. big time. They ended up doing the obvious thing that, mm-hmm. that most of the time they either went to prison, they or, went to prison. or they got killed. Right, so that's, right pretty much the life of most of the drug dealers, unfortunately, that I knew. Right. And they are out now, and they own businesses. And So how long was you dealing before you think you... I started off in high school, probably in my sophomore year. Mm-hmm. And it went, again, I, I did had good grades. I was an All-American in football. I mm. went to the regionals in wrestling. I was an All-American, mm-hmm. honorable mention, All-State, All-LEL, all this and all that. Mm-hmm. I got a football scholarship to Kent State. Mm. I played outside linebacker there, but I still was selling drugs. So you was in college. You was at Kent yeah. State. Full ride. Yeah. But I wow. Quit. And you quit. I literally walked off in the middle of two a days, said I was cool. I had... Probably twenty thousand dollars in this dorm wow. room, and I I quit. I mm. paid for school. My so you quit the team and you stayed in school. I quit the team. I stayed in school. Okay. But eventually, ended up dropping out of school. Okay. Because pretty started, much the same reasons. Yeah. I, mm-hmm. I, I I got curious as to why these people was mm-hmm. bringing me their uh, grandma's wedding rings and. Mm. The car titles and all mm-hmm. this other stuff. I was the smart guy. I wanted the jeans that said, I'm going to try this, but mm-hmm. I'm, I ain't going to get hooked on it. Same mm-hmm. thing as any addiction. No cigarette smoker or any drug, any alcoholic, you know, they never think they go get addicted, you know. Mm-hmm. Nobody plans on getting addicted to anything, right? Mm-hmm. That's never the plan. Mm-hmm. So now it's zero degrees outside and you ride past some businesses and them people outside... <sighs> They, they they don't want to be out, out there, right. but it's a habit. So let's go back a little bit then. Mm-hmm. What you remember the time that made you change your mind and say, "I'm gonna try this"? Yeah. First, my friends and I we were partying. Alcoholism it, it runs in my family, so I always mm-hmm. was a heavy drinker. Same mm-hmm. thing. I can handle it. I'm not gonna be like my family members. <laughs> right, right. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So that wasn't a big deal. And yeah, my friends and I partying. We had it in what's called Primo's first. So we would roll it up in our weed. That, that's, you know? well, that's how most people that, really got that, hooked. That, yeah. that, that's, I call it a, a crackhead mm. starter kit right there. <laughs> <laughs> You're right about that. It, it's definitely, if they want to talk about uh, uh, a gateway, yeah. that definitely yeah. was the gateway. Because you might as well be doing it. Hell, yeah, that's exactly yeah. what it yeah. is. That, that was our, you, our yeah. excuse. We ain't really getting high. Ah, I ain't smoking. And, and more, <laughs> we put more and, and more, more and more right. crack in <laughs> until, you know right. what, uh, I forget that weed, man. That's correct. I graduated. You oh, wow. know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I started in the pipe, man. Mm-hmm. There was no, I'm not going to mince mm-hmm. words of it. Mm-hmm. It is what it is. Yeah. And, you got uh, addicted to crack. Yeah, absolutely. And that's how most people who got addicted to crack mm-hmm. smoked it, right? Mm-hmm. It was in the crack pipe. Mm-hmm. All right. So how long was your addiction? Oh, man. And this is the years when we me and him going back. They had their idea, but then they didn't really know. They didn't really know. They knew I. They damn sure knew I was an alcoholic, though. You got your certain set of people. These mm-hmm. the homies that you drink your forties or drink right. your wine and stuff. And now I'm about to exit stage left and mm-hmm. go in this back room that nobody goes. You exactly. know what I'm saying? Exactly. With, with the rest of the losers. Exactly. Or I'm about to piece y'all out. <laughs> Me and the homies got something else to do. Mm-hmm. I got my set of friends that I was mm-hmm. my primos with, and some of us graduated to just smoking regular crack. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I did that for many years, man. Like many. When did you get to that point where it switched, where, like you say, you had that and everybody thought but didn't know, but when did you know everybody know? You know what? One of my friends from high school, he just straight up asked me. And at that point, I had 
heard the whispers and stuff, and he asked me, and I'm like, yeah, man, I'm, I messed up. At this point, I had dropped out of school, mm-hmm. and I was on my way back to Cleveland. This is down in Kent. Where oh, so you were still down in Kent. I was, yeah, I okay. dropped out of school, but I stayed down there. Okay. You know what I'm saying? And so it, it was easier to be a bum in Kent than it was in Cleveland. Mm, really? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You mm. got couches you can sleep on, things of that nature. Mm. It's, it's a party town, so I can okay. always... Okay. Feed my habit, you know really? what I'm saying? Okay. Yeah, so mm-hmm. I ended up coming back to Cleveland, mm-hmm. and my excuse was to take care of my mom, who was sick, but really it was just, I just had burned all my bridges mm. down there. Mm. And uh, my mom, she ended up needing medical attention around the clock. Again, I'm addicted to drugs while I'm living with her, mm-hmm. and uh, we had to put her in a nursing home. And so I, I went literally went homeless. And mm-hmm. when I say homeless, I'm not talking about... Uh, couch surfing on friends and family's couches. Like I was the guy on uh, around the corner here on 18th and Superior, uh, Bishop Cosgrove sleeping on the grates with the steam coming up with the cardboard on the ground. So let's, let's stay on that point for a minute. When you say you were homeless and you became homeless, you remember the very first night of being homeless when you said, damn, mm-hmm. I am out here with no place. What was that like? Um, I had, Hit a lick. I don't know how I got a large amount of money. Probably stole it from somebody. Mm-hmm. And I went, I think I was like on Kinsman or something like that. Mm-hmm. A lot of this stuff is like a blur to me. Mm-hmm. But when the money's gone, it's a tell. It's a telltale line that they'll tell you. And it's to what you about to do. Mm-hmm. All the money, you know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? We didn't got high all mm-hmm. night. Mm-hmm. And I knew at that point, this female either, she's going to go with somebody somewhere. Or... or Get some people to es- escort me out. <laughs> <laughs> Say it like that. Right. So I just left, and I'm just walking down Kinsman, man, and, mm. and that was it. I, I was officially homeless. homeless. I had burnt all my bridges, and I had lived with some friends, but I knew I couldn't go back there. I had robbed, so I did what dope things did. So where you spend your first night, you remember? Where did I spend my first night? I think I spent my first night... I went to 2100 my first night. So you went on down there? I went on down there. Okay. I went on down there. But at that time, it was overfilled. And at a certain time, you can't get a bed. Mm-hmm. So my first official night was around that time. Mm-hmm. But I, that's when I, I was on 18th and Superior. And it was an eye-opening moment. I just got used to it. Misery really? Lo- misery loves company. So mm. when you're around a bunch of people that's blaming the rest of the world. Wow. <laughs> when in Rome, do what Rome's do. Mm-hmm. So it was mm-hmm. my mama's fault. It was my dad. It was mm-hmm. everybody's fault except mine. Mm-hmm. And my homies that I was with, mm-hmm. we pillaging, robbing, doing mm-hmm. whatever we can for mm-hmm. drugs. You know what I'm saying? <clears throat> and but my bottom, I had been out there for a few years. Mm, so you was homeless for a few years. Yeah, yeah, I've been out there for a few years, dropping in at 2100 mm-hmm. here and there. And, but yeah, it was a couple years I was out there. So how long was this? Your, and we're going to go back in it, but mm-hmm. how, how long was your total addiction, you think? When I was in full-blown addiction, are we counting the primo years? Yeah, well, let's, let's, years? Let's, let's take the primo years out because you could have overcame that. Let's go when you started, when you say my addiction. And that's when you made that determination where you say, hey, we graduating, and now I'm starting to separate people. Probably 94 to 04. Okay. Because my, my, my first day... And I went to Whitehaven for treatment on the 60th, mm. 55th, and Woodland. Okay. Called Stokes Building. Sobriety date is 11 104. Okay. Okay. And that's the day, the last, the day before that I, I got high or mm-hmm. had a sip of alcohol. So lead me up to that. Lead me up to you walking in, getting ready to say, hey, I'm taking this into my own hands and do something. You, that well, leading up to that, what was that like? Leading up to that, uh, a lot of, again, when, when the life of a, a drug, at least my drug addiction, I can't speak mm-hmm. for everybody, mm-hmm. you know, stealing, robbing. Mm-hmm. I did a lot of uh, the young dope boys. Like I told you, I sold drugs when I was young. Mm-hmm. So, and they got younger and younger over the years. I'm like mm-hmm. 9, 10, 11, 12 years old. Mm-hmm. I would beat them up, take their drugs. Mm-hmm. One thing that I lost, house, cars, relationships, yeah, yeah. burn bridges with my family, mm-hmm. all types of stuff. Mm-hmm. But one thing I did not sell was my clippers, though. Really? And so I was the most well-groomed crackhead. That you, <laughs> you still had a hustle, too, though. You were still cutting hair, wasn't you? I'm cutting, I was cutting hair at, at some bus stops. Had uh, Very few had an outlet mm-hmm. way back in the day. Mm-hmm. And when a person would tell me, man, you got a nice beard on you, man. 
I can take care of you right now while you're waiting on the bus. And my goal was to make $10. If I can get five from him, five from him, I'm going to go get me a small piece of crack for $10, and I'm going to mm. go buy me uh, a $2.50 bottle of Mad Dog, because that's what mm. it was around there, and I'm going to buy me a black and mild. And that's how I spent my days. I'm cutting the hair at Windermere. I'm cutting mm. the hair at the Greyhound bus station. At the same time, I'm walking around asking you for change as you're walking downtown. I'm mm. picking up the cigarette bus in front of the Greyhound station mm. downtown. And I also got into barber college while I was in my addiction. Yeah, I heard that. Now, you, I heard you say that you, you went in there and told them, y'all put me in here, right? right. Yeah, so, I'm not leaving, well, right? Well, how it went was... A friend of mine, he got the he got some financial aid from. Oh my God, I can't. It's FEMA. No, not FEMA. You talking about where they sign up? All the college get it there. FAFSA, right? No, they were the the, the office was on Fifty Fifth. Mm. Anyway, it was the office that was doing it. Organization mm -hmm. they paid for his barber college, and okay. I went to him, and I told him I wanted to be a barber, but I didn't really have no history. Mm -hmm. I don't have a work history, and they said, so you want us to spend. X amount of thousands of dollars on you for barber college, but you ain't got no work history. We don't know if you go show up. And once we give them the money, they're keeping the money. Mm -hmm. And they, I had to go to a doctor, a psychiatrist, a psychologist, and go jump through all these hoops. Really? Because you, when you ask some people for money, you got to jump through hoops. And so, so the program was asking you to do. They would ask me well, to do, do you, that. Do you think they did it because they thought you were homeless, or they didn't think you were serious, or was that the way it went? They, I just that was. I don't know. I guess that was their protocol. Really? Long story short, when I went back to see her, she said, my professional said that we shouldn't pay for you for barber college. And she said, in fact, they said that you shouldn't work around people. They said, we will do, we'll pay for you to go to truck driving school or get you a tow motor license. And so really? you should drive trucks or something that you're not dealing with people on an ongoing basis. Now, why was that? I mean, I can, like they say, hindsight is twenty twenty. Looking back, I was angry. Okay, that's what I was asking. You so know, you, I, okay. It probably showed when I okay. took their test, when I went right. to talk to their professional. Okay. They're probably like, this dude. That, that's uh, what I wanted to get to. Okay, all right. a gasket in I'll, the minute now. Okay. <laughs> and so when I, I sat there at the lady's desk and I teared up mm -hmm. and I said, I'm cool. Now, mm -hmm. she knew I was homeless. Mm. And she said, wait a minute, I'm offering you a lifeline or you don't want to truck driving is that's a good money mm -hmm. or driving a tow motor, which is nothing wrong for the record right. while we on right. in video, mm -hmm. nothing wrong with neither one of those. Mm -hmm. And I told her, look, I'm a barber. That's mm -hmm. all I want to do is be a barber. I just want to cut hair. Mm -hmm. And if I can't do that. I'm just going. She, you literally about to go back to the streets because once you get in the program, mm -hmm. they give you vouchers. And, and I said, I'm cool. Mm. And so I left. Now, I didn't really have an address. They sent letters to my mom's house. Mm -hmm. And so when I would check in my mom, she said, you got this letter from this lady. I opened it. She wanted to see me again. I go back down there. She says, I went to bat for you because mm. I was so moved that you turned me down, turned my, my hand down. So they took a chance on me. Mm. Now, mind you, you learn a lot in the streets. So this right here, this didn't talk me out of, a whole <laughs> lot of stuff. It talked me into, into a, a lot of stuff, stuff. too. So she, I guess I had a good mouthpiece. Mm -hmm. She said, we go pay for school. Now, mind you, I'm still a dope fiend. So in Barber College, I'm an instructor now as well. Barber College takes you about nine and a half months to a year if you go to your, your days you're supposed mm -hmm. to go. Mm -hmm. It took me two and a half years to graduate from Barber College because I'm still a drug addict. Mm. So I used to sleep at the shampoo bowl in the back. I smelled like... Wine, mm -hmm. cigarettes, black and I smelled like yesterday's party. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so my first sponsor, God rest his soul, his name was Odie Burden. We was in the back smoking. And he, an addict can recognize that. I can see a person, an addict across the room. Mm -hmm. Please, if we have a conversation, I know. Mm -hmm. And you probably can mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. And he, we outside, he's like, you ain't got to live like that. And I'm like, what? He, Bro, come on. And so I'm like, he had song. I used to sleep at the bus stop down the street from the From school. the job. From the barber college, wow. you know what I'm saying? It, before they did the corridor and all, that bus stop right across or diagonal from the b, &B mm -hmm. I used to sleep there because wow. my school was on 55th and Broadway. I went mm -hmm. to Ohio Barber Academy. Mm -hmm. Now, I ain't missed no days, mm -hmm. but I wasn't worth the crap in school either. Right. And so he, can, he said, you should go to these AA meetings. And I'm like, man, I'm cool. And I had his number. I was getting high inside of Morris Black. 
Mm. And the lady was, and I had stole some dope. I beat some young boys up. I stole their dope. That's what I did. That's my sur- way of surviving. And so she comes, she leaves out. She come back in. She said, you got to go. She said, I don't know what you did to get this dope, but it's three carloads of people, brothers. They Ooh. all got pistols, and they described you. <laughs> so I know what to do. <laughs> you said they described you. Right. Oh, she wow. Said, you got to get the hell up out of here. I know that's right. I had nobody to call. I called my guy from Barber College, mm. and uh, he was transitioning out of Whitehaven. He said, I'm not coming in Morris Black, but when I call you back, you need to come up out of there. So he called me back in about 15 minutes. He was coming up, what's that, uh, Woodland? Woodland, yeah. Woodland. And uh, he was in a black Cadillac. And he said, I'm coming up, come out right now. And so I dug through the creeks and the crevices mm. of Morris Black, dove in the back of it, and he took me to Whitehaven. Mm. But I was too smelly. The lady was like, I can't admit you in here because if we let you in here, you'll make everybody in here relapse. Wow. You know, uh. I've been partying. And so she said, go home and wait two days. And I'm like, where is home? Okay, I'll go to the, the bus stop out front. Ain't mm-hmm. no home. Right. And so the two days, I think I might have went to 2100 or something. I came mm-hmm. back. And she gave me, she admitted me in. And she gave me a room was probably half of this room right here. Mm-hmm. It was the bare necessities. It was a dresser. It was a bed. It was a bathroom. And she gave me a key. Mm-hmm. And a key. Now, a key is something that we all three in this room, we got a pocket full of them. But that was so significant for me because I get emotional. I, when you said it, I caught it when that, you said it because that's every deep. Every key had been taken from me. So that room, mm-hmm. those four walls was in the Taj Mahal to me. To you. That's yours. And her giving you and, a key is yours. giving it to me. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. She gave it to you. And so when I get in there, mm-hmm. I just, I, I run a bath. Mm. Another thing, you can go home and take a bath anytime mm. you want to. Mm-hmm. So can I now. Mm-hmm. But I hadn't immersed my body in water wow. for years. Wow. Now, I w- it was drop in centers, Bishop Cosmo, mm-hmm. and a mm-hmm. few other places. Mm-hmm. I can drop in and get a meal and take a shower. But to immerse my, myself in water, mm-hmm. I hadn't done that. Mm. And so I made the water as hot as possible. Mm. And obviously, it was like, Damn near thick as mud, because I was that dirty. Wow. And I just cried. And I just begged God that if you could just release me from these demons, Mm -hmm. that I would spend the rest of my life doing whatever I can to serve you and your people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was my last day. Hey, we're going to break on that one. So let me jump in and ask a question real quick. Mm-hmm. All right, we got one. What you got, Latif? So, how did you keep this side of you? Because, like I said, I knew you from college, but you always used to cut my hair. I was the DJ promoter back then. It wasn't a party unless Big Wave was right there with us. Mm-hmm. How did you keep that side of the drugs? Because everybody knew. That Wave was going to get chewed, Wave was going to get <laughs> blasted, Wave was going to get drunk, <laughs> and we was going to have to lift Wave up out of the party. <laughs> Many Labor Temple nights, we had to try to take two to three of us to lift you up out of the party, but I did never knew that you did drugs. How did you conceal that from mm. some of your closest friends and family that you was just, you just drunk, you just drink, but you didn't do drugs? How did you keep that from people? Latif, honestly, bro, <laughs> you probably the only one that didn't know, one of the only ones. <laughs> if you think back, and I'm not going to mention no names, but if you connect the dots with the crew that I ran with, and we'll leave that right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I, like I said, I, I was but oblivious. You, you, you was DJing and, and talking on the mic and stuff. Mm-hmm. I'm dipping off in the parking right. lot. You see what I'm saying? I'm dipping off in the parking lot. I'm coming back in, taking two or three shots of 151. I'm going mm. back in the parking lot. I'm leaving for an hour or so. You was working, bro. <laughs> I just got to be back there to help you carry some crates out. <laughs> That's all you came in. Or you going to carry <laughs> me out after you carry, which is probably what it was most wow. of the time. Wow. But yeah, That's... I guess I did a good job at it, man. Yeah, you – they say a lot of times people – are functioning alcoholics, mm-hmm. functioning drug addicts. Yep, all the time. Yeah. And 
they're able to put on that show and it's amazing to just hear like a whole different side of you that was even deeper than what I thought. And maybe I was just clueless because, like you said, I'm hustling on the yeah, DJ you side, working, the commercial side. You was side. a family man. You was handling your business, so you ain't have time to mm-hmm. focus in on me. You know what I'm saying? Let's get back into this. Um, mm-hmm. So you got your key. Yeah. Finally got a, a sense, able to wash a lot of stuff off of you, mm-hmm. not just the dirt, just a clean bath and able to get all that dirt off of you. Mm-hmm. And now it's starting to click in. Right. So tell me, what was that like? Now well, you, the okay. next day you're getting yourself together. The, was that the organization that really helped push you out or did you go back out and had to start over again? No, I, I went to treatment one time. Okay. I know a lot of guys, everybody has their mm-hmm. own path, you mm-hmm. know, not, but the streets were my ass, bro. No, that's right. And I knew that was my last shot. I went hard or go hard with everything that I do. Mm-hmm. And I, when I used to get high, I would have a lady of the evening with me or something, mm-hmm. and we'll be in a room or tucked off in a abandoned building or something. I used to smoke crack so fast that I, that dope fiends would be like, I'm gone. Mm-hmm. Now you got... A eight ball of crack right here to make a, a fellow drug addict to say, I'm leaving you because mm-hmm. you about to bust your heart open. Mm-hmm. I just went so hard at everything. And it's the same way that I attack everything. Mm-hmm. So that, it's the same thing for my recovery. Mm-hmm. I'm living right now on mm-hmm. a promise that I made to God because I'm not going back. Mm-hmm. I'm just not going back. Mm-hmm. And I had to take a, and we have what's called group therapy. Mm-hmm. And so I had to go to the barber college and tell them, look, I got to. I got to drop out. And they said, we'll hold your station for you. Mm. And I left for three months, and I had to start back. But when I got back, I didn't have a lock on my locker. My smock was there. My book was there. Along Since I got clean, man, God has been just dropping. They say success leave hints. God just leave me small nuggets, sometimes big nuggets, to let me know. You are on the right path. Mm-hmm. Keep going down this path. Everything was there. So how difficult was recovery going through the actual, when you say you left for the three months, how difficult was those three months for you? I was just so grateful. When we mm-hmm. was in group co- uh, group therapy, I was in a room, and there's 30 of us. Mm-hmm. And my first day, we had an inst- not instructor, but our counselor's name was Larry. God rest his soul. He's mm-hmm. gone now. Mm-hmm. He said, look to your left, look to your right. He was like, because probably 90, 99% of y'all won't be here. Mm-hmm. Most of y'all go relapse. And to this day, in that room, when I'm thinking about all those guys, I can think about three individuals mm-hmm. that did not relapse since then mm-hmm. that I can think of. Mm-hmm. And they're still my homies until this day. Mm-hmm. But I was always this cheerful dude that you see in public. That's my persona. Mm-hmm. Because I don't care what I'm going through. Nothing is worse than begging another man for money. Mm. Nothing is worth than smoking crack in an abandoned building in mm. Cleveland, Ohio, mm-hmm. when it's 10, <laughs> 10 degrees below zero. Outside, right. I right. don't care right. what I go through. Right. And right. I off, it ain't that bad. It ain't that bad. So you got through that. I got through that. Mm. But back to Larry, I was all I was just so grateful for I had to have that shot. I knew that was my last shot. Mm-hmm. It's either recovery or die. Mm. That was it. There you were. Go back to the streets. I'm going to die. die. Because when he picked you up, you were going. If those guys would have caught you, that was it. Yeah, exactly. That was it. And it wasn't. It's just I got stuff to do. You ever heard somebody say, man, you got so much potential when you was younger. Mm -hmm. I heard that so much. Mm -hmm. And and I'm tired of having potential. Mm -hmm. I want the prize. I want it. Mm -hmm. You got potential to do this. You got potential to do that. Mm -hmm. I don't want the damn potential. I I want it. Damn the potential. Mm -hmm. And and they were right. I knew I had the potential. Mm -hmm. My mom didn't raise me to be a drug dealer or or drug addict. But it runs rampant in my family. My mom used to tell me that when I used to come home from school a little tipsy. She used to always Mm -hmm. say, Watch that drink, your father, your mm-hmm. uncle, da 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 da, mm-hmm. and I didn't pay it no attention. That's correct. Mm-hmm. But again, hindsight is twenty twenty. Mm. But Larry used to say, I used to be so cheerful. He used to say, "Wave, you look at life through these rose colored glasses." Mm. And after I left the program, I would come back to just check in with them. 
And every time I would see Larry, I'd be like, Larry, I still got these rose colored glasses <laughs> on, bro. Because it's, it's good. Because mm-hmm. nothing is worse than what I've been through. Mm-hmm. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. It's, it's good. And I'm talking about when I, I had kidney cancer back in 2015. Mm-hmm. It wasn't worse than smoking crack, bro. <laughs> Period, bro. It, it's, and wow. I, and that's you. Uh, he said it wasn't even worse. That was. It's not. Wow. Wow. It's not. That's deep. It's not because the crack thing I did to myself, mm-hmm. the cancer is just whatever. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you go back and they got your stuff. You decide, hey, there's nothing good. They didn't take nothing from right. me. I still got my gold clippers. Right. I'm ready to roll. I'm, and so I had to start over again, but my stuff was still there. So it took me a whole nother year to graduate, but I graduated, man. The whole I came out. I worked in a friend of mine's shop who happened to be, he was a hustler. Mm-hmm. And he just came to me right before I graduated. He waved, you know what I'm doing, man. I'm out in these streets, but I need somebody solid to run my shop. Mm. So I worked in his shop. And it was not, I started, the first shop I started in, I was still in treatment. Mm. And this cat selling dope on the side, mm. dudes in mm. the back shooting dice. This shit wasn't just good. Right. And so the whole time, you can learn a lot from, from people what to do. You can also learn what not to do. Mm. And the whole time I'm making mental notes, I'm in treatment. And the things that I have now are the things that I wrote down. Mm. And I prayed for them. Mm. I knew I wanted to have a barbershop. God mm. blessed me with three of them. I knew I wanted to be a barber instructor. And God blessed me to be at the largest barber school in the state of Ohio and have taught in every barber school in Ohio. Mm. So I know that today I'm an example and I'm being watched. Mm-hmm. You you can't tell me it's tough. Mm-hmm. I, I know it's tough. You can't tell me you can't do it. Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. it's really, does anybody sit in my chair that they tell me something that I can't identify with? Mm-hmm. You know Mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I know that's the reason why the good Lord allowed me to survive the things that I did. So let's talk about some of the stuff because we want to go into some of the good stuff. Dealt in the bad, and I understand you're coming out. That was your first shot. When did Waverly... Mm-hmm. Willis, the man, the legend, I'm ready to now get into instructing. I'm ready now to start giving back to my community. I'm ready now to open up my own shop of my own, and this mm-hmm. is what I'm going to do. I know you've been very involved in communities back on um, helping Frank Jackson on his camp. That's when I first met you back in those days. Then mm-hmm. after that, I know you did a lot in the last, a lot to help out Mayor Bibb. And just that's political, but you do. That's just the political stuff. All the other stuff you do, all the good wisdom you're giving to the people and teaching them. And I see that you're teaching and giving classes or cutting hair at the juvenile detention center Mm -hmm. and things of that nature. So tell me how that all came about and how you transition, coming out of that and transitioning into that. Okay, my first thrust into the public eye was my client, I left, I opened up my own shop and my client. What was your first shop you opened up? It's Urban Cuts Barbershop. The first one was on 111th in Detroit Avenue. Okay. And I opened that up in um, May of 2008. I worked in a barbershop from 05 to 08. Mm-hmm. That's when I opened up my own shop. And so I'm talking to brothers, and we having the same thing. As you can see, I ain't missing no meals. So <laughs> weight problem, mm-hmm. high blood pressure, mm-hmm. diabetes. And now I'm, I'm, I'm missing people. And so I run into a wife, a son, a daughter, girlfriend, whatever, at the neighborhood, Mm -hmm. laundromat, cleaners, grocery store. What happened to such and such? What happened to Mike? Oh, Mike just wouldn't take his blood pressure medicine, and he died of a stroke. He died Mm. of a heart attack. Mm. And I took that to heart because this is a brother that I see every week. Mm -hmm. And we shared our stories of the battle with food, this, Mm -hmm. that, and the other. Mm -hmm. And I know if I would have said, Mike, been taking your blood pressure medicine, Mm -hmm. I know that I could have made a difference. I know for a fact Mm -hmm. because I just recognized the power that I had behind this being people's barber. Mm -hmm. That's a relationship Mm -hmm. of trust. So Mm -hmm. even if you're a client, if you see me every week, obviously you like something about me besides my service that I give you. And he probably would have opened up to you why he's not taking. Exactly. And so I started having those conversations, getting in deeper. Mm -hmm. Brothers weren't taking it because it's messing with their their manhood, Mm -hmm. things of that nature. Okay, Mm -hmm. man, look, you got to tell that. First, tell that to your wife. Tell Mm -hmm. that to your girl. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And tell it to your doctor. You Mm -hmm. can get it tweaked. So Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. I started taking blood pressure myself mm -hmm. and researching blood pressure. It's the silent killer. Mm. I got high blood. Everybody in the damn shop, everybody <laughs> can, We all got high, high blood, blood pressure. pressure. Right. So I said, okay, I'm just a barber. I contact Cleveland Clinic. I started bringing in professionals from the mm -hmm. clinic to mm -hmm. screen us, educate us, and refer us about high blood pressure. Okay. And so now we always go cry about the Browns and the Cavs. That's automatic. We all, we it's a barbershop, so we mm -hmm. go talk about Nicki Minaj's backside. Mm -hmm. We go do that. But I'm also having conversations about uh, yoga poses. And mm -hmm. my, my proudest moments is when we all in the shop, all these macho men, and we exchanging a vegetarian lasagna recipes and things mm -hmm. of that nature. Mm -hmm. Those are my proudest moments. So we started a walking club emerged out of that. A cooking classes emerged out of that. And I guess that's how the local news started paying me some attention. I got a story on that. Mm -hmm. And you know, I said, I'm on to something here. So now the blood pressure program has been going on for years now. And I can honestly say we have saved lives. It's been to the point that brothers have had blood pressure so high that we've had to tell them, look, bro, skip the haircut. You go straight to the ER. Wow. So you're doing testing right there. Yeah, we wow. doing blood pressure testing right in the shop. Okay. And and they've came back to me and said, and this has happened on more than one occasion mm -hmm. at all of my shop. Mm -hmm. Man, I appreciate you doing that blood pressure. The ER doctor didn't even know how I drove there. So mm -hmm. they was about to stroke out, mm -hmm. heart attack, whatever. So I know that we saved lives. And, okay, I got a platform now. Mm -hmm. So now I've always, when I wrote down in treatment, I wanted my barbershop to be a community center. Mm. And that's what my barbershops are. They're a community center that you can just happen to get a haircut at. Wow. And now <clears throat> we morphed that into, we just, we in the process of doing prostate screening. That's when I formed, while I was in, in the treatment, I formed the Urban Barber Association. Okay. Which is a legitimate 503 seat. Mm -hmm. I wrote it down while I was, again, I'm doing two and $3 haircuts mm -hmm. in the uh, laundry room at the treatment center. I'm going through Barber College. I went. I worked at um, Cleveland Clinic at night as a nurse's aide. I went to the Red Cross, mm. got my nurse aide class. So mm -hmm. at night, I'm working at, at Cleveland Clinic as a nurse's aide. In the mm -hmm. daytime, I'm at the barber shop. That's the one you you, yeah, you I'm, come to, yeah. Uh -huh. And so the first, so yeah, man. I'm, and and again, I'm learning what not to do. So I'm saving every penny I got, mm -hmm. and I know that I know what I'm rearing up for. And so I got this platform. And uh, we're in the process now. We're doing prostate screens. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're not not the regular exam, the mm -hmm. blood exam. We had a prostate <laughs> bus pull up. Brothers go out. They did screen. And to date, we've had roughly close to 100 guys screened. Okay. And to my knowledge, we got one brother that tested positive. He, he found out he got prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. And he's going through the treatment now. The doctor's telling him that he caught it early enough. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's a 90 percentile of survival if you catch it in the early stages. But I'm using my platform to tell brothers, 17 black men die every day from prostate cancer. Mm. Every 13 minutes, a black man gets diagnosed with prostate cancer. Don't worry about it. Right. What, what about when we talk about the juveniles? I want to go there a little bit because mm -hmm. I know these young guys, young guys. Are, are off the chain these days and you're doing some work to try to help them and just giving them haircuts and talking with. I mm -hmm. saw where you give you guys the almost like a coach's pep talk before y'all yeah. go in there and, and say, hey, guys, I need y'all to engage and talk with yeah. them and right. listen to what they're saying and, right. and give them some advice and good feedback. How you get involved in that? Well, and, and tell people how to, what's that program about? That's the Urban Barber Association. That's our, it's called Care Cuts. Okay. And we not only do that at the Juvenile Detention Center, we do that at elementary schools. Mm -hmm. We do it all around the city, churches, wherever. Mm -hmm. And I use my students from uh, at the Barber College that I teach at. And, and so, of course, we're teaching them how to cut hair. Mm -hmm. But I'm also showing them with this responsibility of servicing the client, you're going to be a pillar in the community. Your neighborhood barbershop, we've been around for years. Mm -hmm. So they can talk about LeBron James as their hero, mm -hmm. but we are neighborhood heroes That's because correct. we watch your kids while they go to school. Mm -hmm. I'm watching the creepy dude. I'm coming out my shop saying, yo, right. what is you doing talking to them kids, bruh? Right. I'm letting you know I'm watching you. Mm -hmm. That really has happened mm -hmm. several times. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> right. So 
I'm letting them know that they will have a platform when they graduate. Mm -hmm. Use it to mm. make more than money. Everybody want to make money, but nobody wants to make a difference. Mm. You can't make a difference by having these conversations. Mm. And that's the pep talk that you see. They don't allow us. They make us lock our camera, our phones, and everything up. So I would show footage back there, but mm -hmm. they won't. Mm -hmm. And then the juvenile detention center, they're as young as nine years old. Wow. There's no misdemeanors back there. Mm. So we have conversations every other week with the Kia boys, mm. with the heartless felons, and the number, and it's so hard to break down that barrier. So I mm. lean heavily in on my 18, 19, 20, 21 year olds, because those are the, they're, that's their homies. Mm -hmm. And so I, I tell them, you need to, to tell them in a year you're gonna have a barber license, possibly in two or three years you'll have a barber shop. Mm. The same dudes you used to steal cars with, the same dudes you smoke that water with, because Mm -hmm. Water's the new crack for mm -hmm. the young people. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? You need to tell them. You need to plant that seed that they don't have to steal cars. So either they go get out the chair after you cut their hair, thinking about how they go steal a car when they get out, or how they go to school to be a truck driver, get their welding license, be a productive citizen. And the consistency of us going down there, it's hard for me to get through. And so I'm talking to the young brothers, and this is a real conversation that I've had on several times, I don't know, I don't know, mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. And so, look, ma'am, I'm just a young, an older brother talking to a young brother. That's one thing I ain't never had. What? An older brother talking to me. Mm -hmm. I ain't never had no positive black role model in my life. Not, now they're animated across the room. I don't even know who my father is across the, uh, on the other side. I know who my father is, but he ain't shit but a crackhead. He ain't nothing but a dope fiend. Mm -hmm. My dad locked up. I ain't never had no black man talk to me either. And I don't blame these young boys. I blame us mm -hmm. because we the ones that fathered these kids and left them for dead. Mm -hmm. So they just doing, the, if, if, if you leave a child alone, the streets are going to adopt them. And that's what's happening. Mm -hmm. That's all. That's the only thing that me, when I talk to them, that's the only subject matter that I can get them to speak on is I don't have a black role model, a male role model in my life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> I was just telling Latif, I had to go down there on my birthday because they say y'all always come back. Mm -hmm. And cons cons consistency is missing out of their life. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so I'm just, again, I'm just going down there to get my students to know that you you have the ability to change your life. If you can change your mind, you can change your life. Let's go back to something you said earlier. You mentioned the fact that you said the drug, drug dealers got younger. Yeah. And, and you said you were doing it. We, I grew up and I graduated in 86. Mm -hmm. So I came out in 86. So I'm not too far behind you. Uh -huh. And in that, I understand we went to Lincoln West. Uh -huh. And so at Lincoln West, I always said that, hell, we came from St. Clair, 105, St. Clair, Glenville, that. Mm -hmm. And, man, it was heavy over there, too. Mm -hmm. And a lot of drug dealers and crackheads came out of Lincoln West that year mm -hmm. during those times. And a lot of successful people as well, so I'm not going to just say that. But we did have a – it ran rapid. It's something that happened in our community, man, that got us to this point of – and I don't know if that generation of drugs just infiltrated us so bad that the drug dealers got younger because they were out there on their own because of the family. And I, I think the fatherless is one issue, but the moms as well in those situations, not raising the kids as well, mm -hmm. leaving them out there to fend from themselves. And if they're on drugs and whatnot, they put a lot of pressure on the young men in their in those houses versus the women as well and it's a little different but i think that contributes to the issue as well what do you think we can do right now as a society or as cleveland you think to try to get a handle as much as we can on these young guys to try to help them see not just barbers but other opportunities that may be for more do i don't want to say it's too late but are you thinking the uh, or you think tactics we're using now is just not working well, something is wrong man because it seems like they're getting younger going down there to the juvenile detention the crimes are getting harder and more egregious so what's your take on it you've been in the streets for years and you understand both sides of it so what's your take on that well you're right the, the the young most of the cats I talk to is sixteen years old. 
his mom was 30. Mm -hmm. So she, she was 15, 16 when she had a child. Mm -hmm. It's boys down there that's 15 with two and three kids. Right. So it's a generational thing. Now, what can we do? Now you're about to turn this into a Cat Williams interview. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to let it go there. Yeah. Right. Let, let's stop talking about it. Mm -hmm. All these organizations mm -hmm. that got these mentoring programs, mm -hmm. where they at? Mm -hmm. I'm down there every two weeks. Mm -hmm. Where you at? Mm. I'll leave it like that. Mm -hmm. I ain't. They're not down there. And we all know that. And that's one of the things we're going to talk about more. Waverly just, hundreds, this is first day on our of program. Thousands <laughs> of millions of dollars in grant money. And ain't doing nothing with and it. And gave nobody, uh, Urban Barber Association is mm -hmm. down there every two weeks and it has been for the last mm -hmm. seven years. Mm -hmm. Haven't missed a mm -hmm. Thursday, twice mm -hmm. a month. Mm -hmm. And this is not Waverly saying where y'all at. Mm -mm. That's the Kia that's boy. The, yeah. That's the Kia boy saying where y'all at. Mm -hmm. That's the heartless fella saying, where are you at, black men? Mm. There you go. And I'm going to leave it like that. And, and I'm afraid, because you see, that's what I say. African American Men's Action Network. And that's what we're about. We, we're all about trying to help bring light into that, mm -hmm. whether it's us stepping up ourselves or leaning on more organizations and people who take it for granted to right. always say that they're trying to do something for us, and they're really not. Right. And so we're not going to get on that soapbox because we came to talk about But I will have you back for more, and we're going to talk more about that. Mm -hmm. So, Waverly, what I do want to do is I got some questions. And okay. before I answer these questions, I, I do want to do this because I think this is important because we didn't talk about it. We didn't talk about family. We didn't talk about you married. I am married. You married. We didn't talk about the wife and kids and that kind of thing. And I don't want to go deep. But when did you get to the point that okay, life is good now? Nah, Eva got me a new wife coming in. When did she pop into the picture? Uh, my wife was actually one of my clients, and over mm -hmm. the years, I've had some really lovely ladies mm -hmm. sit in my barber chair or come to my barber shop. Mm -hmm. And one of the rain, main reasons I'm talking about people from the adult entertainment industry mm -hmm. and they have became my friends. And one of the reasons they told me that they came to my shops was because number one, I never tried to holler at them. Mm. And number two, I always had a respectful atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So they would tell me when they were going to the barbershop, all the guys is trying to get at them. Mm -hmm. They just trying to get either get their haircut or get their child's haircut mm -hmm. and go about their business. Mm -hmm. But my wife, she was the only female that I've ever tried to talk to. <laughs> and be, before I even approached her, mm -hmm. I had cut her hair several times mm -hmm. before that. Mm -hmm. And it was just we just had been through some similar things in mm -hmm. the past. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know what? I'm going to break my rule on this one. Mm. And the the initial call was, it's probably cheesy and corny, but it <laughs> is what it is. I said, look, I don't really talk to my clients. Mm -hmm. However, and I don't want to call it a date, mm -hmm. but we both humans, we both got to eat. Mm -hmm. So I just want to take you to a restaurant and sit across the table from you. <laughs> And just have some conversation. <laughs> and that was that uh, your first time hollering at somebody since you've been through all of that and trying to get it? And I imagine you done ran into some, but actually really, you know what, I'm going to put my... Sincerely, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. I had a, a few yeah. relationships right. relationships prior right. to that. When I was young and recovering, mm -hmm. still figuring out myself. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. So I was probably a little, little bit scared to, mm -hmm. to delve deeper. Mm -hmm. But I, I felt like it was time. And I think, I don't think God... I don't believe in coincidences. Right. So how long y'all been married? Met in 2012. We've only been married for five years. Okay. So okay. we have was a blended family. She had kids. I uh -huh. had kids. Okay. And uh, we're a happy family, man. I know that's a big part of it. And, and, and I want to always let the brothers get an opportunity to get that out on mm -hmm. these shows to let everybody know that. So I got my final questions for you. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to let you in our program. If you could trade places with anybody for a day to do what they do or just to not do what they do, to do something different, who do you think that would be? I would play trade places with Jesus. <laughs> Jeez, you went all the way to the top. Okay. I just would like to, I don't know everything. You want to know? Everyone. You, you just know, want to know. I, I want that wisdom. Mm. You know? That's interesting. Mm -hmm. And I had a lot of them. That was that's the first one on that one for mm -hmm. sure. You say Jesus. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Okay, we're going to let that one go. What's your guilty pleasure? My guilty pleasure is sweets. And that's about sweet, every last brother. That's sweet, why you say we all got high blood pressure, diabetes. Right. Everybody sit right there. First thing right. come out of their mouth. There's got to be something sweet. Yeah. <laughs> What's your, what is the sweet you like? Really anything, but chocolate is, mm. is my number one go-to. Mm. I got hooked on lifesaver gummies. Yeah. I'm hooked on gummies, yeah, man. Right. Any kind of gummies. Yeah. I, you put a bag in here. I sit here this whole show. I went and tore up. Mm. It started out with Twizzlers. Then yeah. I went from Twizzlers into these gummies days, yeah. man. And every time the kids go out to the store, hey, bring me back a bag of <laughs> lifesaver right. gummies. Right. I tear those things up. If it was something you wish you were better at. Something you wish you were better at. If it was something I wish I was better at. Communicating with these young people, man. Mm. Getting through. That's why mm. I got to bring my secret mm. weapon, which is... Mm. Other young people. That's good. That's a really good one. All right, here's one you're going to have to think about because you done been through a whole lot. Mm -hmm. What's the worst pit, bit of advice you ever got? The worst bit of advice? Here, try this. <laughs> I was waiting to hear you say, ah, because I had a couple of guys, we all have been through our thing, uh -huh. and it, it was either... Hey man, come on, get in this car. Right. Or like you say, or right, try this. Mm. Or come on, man, it ain't you no know, big deal. Yeah. That is always that. Last one. What never fails to make you smile? When you think about it and you think about it at the end of the day, what never ceases to make you smile, man? You be like, yeah, that's some good stuff. Uh, my family, man. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people think I'm a super extroverted person because mm -hmm. they see me posting a lot, da da da. -da. Mm -hmm. But I'm super introverted. Mm -hmm. You know, I like being at home mm -hmm. with the family. I like being out to dinner with the family. I don't hang out. You'll see me places. Right. If I'm invited, you'll see me. You'll right. see me in a lot of pictures. Mm -hmm. But my wife often, my fraternity just had our, our Founders Day. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm going to go kick it with the brothers. And she just get to laugh and she said, you'll be back. <laughs> I was home before 10 o'clock. I go hang out for a minute, but I, I like being home. I done done dollar night. I done done top shelf night, bottom shelf night, stripper night. I night. All the yeah. nights. I, did, I done been there <laughs> right. and I done that. They say the game right. don't change just the player. So now I'm just this old dude. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm cool. I'm cool. Yeah. I'm cool. Anything I want to do, I did it's it. It's too dangerous out Oh, here, man. Now, it's man. just crazy you everywhere. Your head. I don't like having to keep my head on a swivel in, in mm -hmm. places, which you got to do that anyway, mm -hmm. but more places. I feel bad that, and sometimes I would just ride through East Cleveland mm -hmm. just to see my hometown. Mm -hmm. And I just like, wow, man, I just don't feel at home here no more. It's not the East Cleveland mm -mm. from 89. No, and, and I, I grew up in Glenville that. the same way. They didn't even tore my house down. So when I ride down my old street, I look, I'm like, because like you say, you can't help it. I live in Cleveland Heights, but I grew up down the way. Even when I get off the freeway or whatever, you can't help. I'm going to cut through the way. You cut through the old hood and you get to where you're going. And every time, but now I finally, when I rolled down there and they tore my house down, I looked at it and I said, you know what? I ain't got no reason. To, even though I was never stopping by, I always just right. rolled by there. But I'm like, I ain't even got no reason. Because like you said, it don't even feel like home. Now. And I feel sad about that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Over the years, people mm -hmm. from East Cleveland have asked me to open up a barber shop in East Cleveland, mm -hmm. and I had to turn them down. And my mm -hmm. reason is this: I'm not going to ask anyone else to do anything that I'm not willing to do. Mm -hmm. So I'm only in the shop two days a week now. Mm -hmm. I'm teaching too, so I'm, mm -hmm. and I'm doing a lot of other stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not going to ask nobody to work in East Cleveland because mm -hmm. I'm not willing to do it. Mm -hmm. And I hate saying that. And mm -hmm. I know mm -hmm. I'm gonna probably hear a bunch of backlash. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in my inboxes and all this other mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. But it, it is, is what it is. I'm, I'm yeah. just not. Mm -hmm. I'm just not willing to do that. Well, and, and but it, it's what you need to do to maintain success of your brand and what you're doing. Right. It's Walmart and some of these others don't come in some of these neighborhoods because of that. Right. And, and it's not because of that, because they got to protect their brand. And right. they know if I bought my brand here, it's going to require me to do things that's outside of what we like to do within our brand. Right. And so therefore it's not comfortable for us. And that's all you're saying. Right. But East Cleveland, because of a whole lot of reasons, you, yeah. you ain't got a name. I mean, it's just, record, it's, it's, yeah. it's certain parts of Cleveland too. <laughs> 
Yeah. Dude, I've been asked. Well, yeah. So it's the same yeah. thing. It's not, I don't want to sing it out East Cleveland. Right. I'm just not willing to do that. No, because you were over on the west side and where you at, and you got some good areas, and yeah. your spots are really nice. They're not in the best area, no. but they're okay. They're okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah I like them. Mm -hmm. Waverly, we really appreciate you coming on, sharing with us all the information you gave us, going personal, man. We're putting together a thing with African-American males this year to really try to push as much as we can to get more African-American males involved in voting, involved in everything that's going on and looking for more resources that organizations can do to help more African-American brothers that are out here struggling. So this is an open platform and you got an open door anytime you want to come back to talk about anything you want to, awesome. feel free to do that. We're going to be putting some panel discussions, definitely going to have you back to sit on a few of our panels and do that. But right now, I'm going to give you that camera. And you can sit there and tell the people anything that you want that's on your mind that you want to let them. All his information and his contact information, how you can get in touch with him, and where his shops are will be in the descriptions at, on the bottom of this link when we finish this program. First and foremost, I'd like to thank you, Mr. Dow, mm -hmm. for uh, allowing me to sh for sharing your platform with me. Thank you. And I would like to tell you, everyone out there, tune in to Strategic Moves. Like, subscribe, and share strategic moves with Mr. Ken Dow. This is America's favorite barber, Big Wave the Boss, asking you to please follow me on all platforms at Waverly Willis and learn the exciting things that we're going to be doing at WaverlyWillis.com. There it is. That's Waverly Willis. Everything you need to know about the brother we'll have in the links in the description, and we'll see you next week. Peace.